is the chair of the Buena Ventura IEEE Computer Society and would like to introduce our speaker and topic for tonight. Tonight's presentation will be on Mutual Agent Dynamic Games or MAD Games. Professor Raul Mangaharam from the Department of Electrical, Eng Electrical and Systems Engineering in the School of Engineering and Applied Sciences at the University of Pennsylvania will be presenting MAD Games. Uh, balancing performance and safety around autonomous vehicles in a multi-agent environments. Um, I'm excited to hear more about this. Professor Mangaram, thank you for accepting our invitation and I'll turn it over to you to present. Thank you. Sure. Thank, thank you, Don, and thank you everyone from the IEEE BV uh, uh, section. Uh, I'm, it, this is a real pleasure to be here. Uh, and today we have a very, very exciting topic. It's about racing really fast crashing and actually now programming these self-driving racing cars to have the most competitive mindset of a, a racing driver. So the question really is, you know, at the end of this talk is like, do you have what it takes to build the most, you know, competitive uh, and competent autonomous driving driver? So, uh, so I'll, I'll, Talk about you know why we focus on you know driving at the limits of uh, uh, of handling, but obviously that that's fun and thrilling. But what does it get us as engineers, right? So um, so by way of introduction, uh, my name is Rahul Mangaram, and uh, I serve as the director of uh, X Lab, which is the lab that designs safe autonomous systems in the University of Pennsylvania, and that's in Philadelphia. And uh, one of the roles I have here is I also serve as a pen director for a center called Safety 21. And this is a $20 million US Department of Transportation, National Transportation Center, focused on building the future of safe and efficient movement of people and goods. Uh, another hat I wear is with the open source of you know, uh, self-driving. I serve on the board of the Autoware Foundation uh, Autoware is a 70 industry member consortium. It's a nonprofit consortium that develops the world's leading open source autonomous vehicle software. And uh, I also serve as a director for the Autoware Centers of Excellence, which has over 35 uh, academic uh, members across the globe that use Autoware in all kinds of you know, full size self driving vehicles. And uh, finally, part of what I will talk about today is, you know, we have these one tenth scale, you know, high speed autonomous racing platforms, uh, and we have developed a community, you know, for doing research, for education, and for having a lot of competitions. And this has spread across to over eighty universities across the world. Um, and uh, so we'll we'll look at you know this exciting world of uh, autonomous racing. So now you and me. Uh, especially in the LA traffic, know what it's like to drive through rush hour. And here you can see this vehicle is trying to make a merge, uh, but this yellow truck is not giving them uh, any room. And uh, so, you know, we nudge along and we eventually, you know, uh, figure out how to get across most of the time. And so in civilian driving, you know, the goal is to be as safe as possible. But if you reach home, like, you know, four or five minutes late, big deal. Nobody's going to say, well, you're, it's great you're home, at least you're alive. I mean, we take that for granted. But so safety is well defined. You want to maximize safety, but performance of the system is not well defined. So in fact, if you really want to be as safe as possible, you would just, you know, park your car in the garage and just leave it there, especially if it's self-driving. And so the challenge for self-driving in, you know, in trying to merge and even in this very common case is that it treats this non-cooperative -co scenario, uh, which has competing objectives, uh, it still struggles to actually do that with you know, the way human traffic works. And so then we said, okay, why don't we actually take this to the limit and really look at this in the case of autonomous racing? So here you see, uh, I think this is Alonzo and Vettel driving at you know, over 300 kilometers per hour you know, very high speed, you know, very fast reactions needed. Uh, this is like, you know, a very, very risky sport. And uh, 
the question here then is, you know, how can you uh, sort of uh, now, if you get, you get penalized, if you're overly aggressive uh, and uh, you crash and you're out of the game and you get penalized if you're overly conservative. And, uh, and in fact, if you're slightly conservative, in fact, if you're just half a second slower in your overall, you know, lap time, you're out of the top 10. And, uh, and as you can see over here with, you know, the F1 in mean, just the 20, in one of the seasons like that, right? So, and, uh, 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 just give me a minute. I just have some disturbance here. Sorry about that. Uh, so, so now if we if we look at like, well, you know, driving at the maximum speed is not, you know, the the only goal here. In fact, the winner of you know the races from 1950 to 2022 achieved the fastest lap time only about 40 percent of the time. So, in fact, the goal here is to have this consistency in achieving the right balance between aggressiveness and restraint, or safety and performance. And being able to make that judgment on the fly, you know, in the context of the scenario, but being able to, you know, switch that operating point dynamically, and uh, and that will allow us to build this racer. And so here we are essentially operating on a vehicle that is with full dynamics like that, right? So you're you're operating at the nonlinear edge of, you know, your your tire slip, and uh, and if you are not operating at the edge of your handling. The limits of your handling, then well, the competitors are, and they are going to sort of outcompete you. So you have high speeds, high accelerations, very fast reactive uh, reaction times are needed, and you have full dynamics. So this is a really a continuous, you know, game where you're trying to plan how your systems are now uh, going to achieve not just the next, you know, uh, hundred milliseconds, but how is it going to take the first turn, the next turn, uh, and do it at the limits of handling. So obviously crashing is expensive and dangerous over here. And it happens, uh, you know, quite often in these kind of races uh, because you're getting as close to, you know, the, the limits of your handling as close to as the, the maximum risk level you can manage. Uh, and sometimes you cross that or the drivers cross that. The second thing is, you know, we have you no know, radars, lidars and different kinds of sensors on these vehicles. And they can tell you what the pose is, what's the position, what's the rotation angle, maybe predict a little bit about where that vehicle is going to go in the next, you know, few hundredths of a millisecond. But they don't tell you, like, you know, they don't, sensors don't tell you what the opponent's behavior is, what's their intention, what's in the mind of the opponent, and how are they going to now try to do the next maneuver. And in fact, just observing, you know, these elite policies uh, just with your sensors gives you very like multimodal behaviors in the sense that, well, will they overtake from the left or the right? And so what we want to determine is that by successive observations of our opponents, can we determine what is their driving strategy or what is the policy of the driver? How are they going to most likely behave in the next turn or when they come to another opponent? And therefore, once we have a good estimate of that, we can outcompete them. The thing is that, you know, with lots of machine learning, they say, oh, why don't you look at the last, you know, 10 races or the 20 races or the last uh, 10 seasons and learn from that. The thing is that with every season with racing, there's a new vehicle. There are uh, the, the track conditions are different. The mindset of the races are different. The competitors are different. And that kind of interaction that happens uh, that results in a different uh, set of strategies these strategies are basically all secret prior to the race. And so essentially we don't operate in a large data regime where we can do supervised learning on prior you know, behaviors or races. We have a very small data regime over here. So we have to figure out how to now work with almost no data about the opponent, but be able to adapt to what we observe on the fly. So that brings us to what we'll talk about today is that, you know, by looking at racing as an example, you know, a lot of the technology that's in race cars, uh, whether it's NASCARs, Formula One cars, uh, Indy uh, uh, race cars, 
they that the technology is like you know anti lock braking systems uh, like uh, traction control like superchargers they all come into our everyday vehicles and the question here is can we just use autonomy to provide you know a, an a superhuman capability of driving and achieve safety through agility and we want to see what can we learn from actually pushing this vehicle to the limits uh, but balancing safety and aggressiveness and so the first question really is you know how do we generate the most competitive agents who are dynamically able to balance safety and assertiveness as as our goal over here uh, and be able to outcompete their opponents so this is part of uh, work that we had uh, 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 built few years ago and i'm going to sort of take this as you know a step by step approach to building up like what is this competition how do we deal with it there'll be a little bit of math but don't worry about the math i'll provide you the intuition and i think that's much more interesting so usually what we are doing in this kind of case is that you know we are trying to figure out you know what is the opponent going to do next and so essentially we want to uh, put this in 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 a setting of a robust reinforcement learning problem where we are estimating you know we have an estimate of costs over a set of actions over time uh, that the opponent is going to do next the opponent is not in our control and they have a mind of their own and so we want to figure out like you know how can we minimize our cost in the sense that how can we overtake them uh but we need a good estimate of what they are going to do next and so so we we don't since we don't know the opponent's behavior we need to sort of look at this as a mini max problem where we are trying to figure out like what's the how can we minimize the maximum uncertainty about the opponent and uh, that will sort of allow us to estimate what will they do next and so we have a way to capture this you know in this configuration where we look at the opponent's behavior as part of this uncertainty set and say okay well what could they do next and how are they going to behave next and we parameterize this uncertainty set over here and the question here is you know to sort of look at now uh, what is the how do we how do we actually now parameterize this uncertainty set here we essentially have what is called the state action transition probabilities or psa that means now the the opponent is in this state and what kind of action are they going to do next we have a sequence of observations of the opponent and what we are trying to do is say okay if the opponent is going to take this path then we have and and we have a good estimate of how they're going to behave we can actually drive very close to them be very aggressive and try to outcompete them i will build upon this story as we go forward like that right so uh, the whole idea is that you know the initially we don't know much about the opponent so we have a larger ambiguity set or an uncertainty about their behavior so we are going to actually be much more conservative because they could do any possible have any possible behavior and so we want to maintain safety but we sacrifice performance but now as we observe the opponent we are going to actually start to become more aggressive in and around them because we know they are going to do this more likely than they are going to do something else and so the goal is really to learn a useful parameterization for this uncertainty about how is opponent going to behave when you're driving you know uh, on 405 for example you know when there is a driver that's weaving through traffic what they're going to do next uh, uh, but you're going to also stay a little bit away because you know that they are more unpredictable than say some you know toyota prius that is just driving slowly you know in the right most lane like that right so uh, so the question now when we are racing is that we don't know a priori you know what the opponent is strategy is going to be like so what we are going to do is going to offline prior to the race we are going to actually use a technique called self play that means we are going to generate uh, some agents and let them compete in a simulation based game in fact going to let millions of these agents compete and find the agents that actually start to have a good strategy and a and a driving policy and they come on top of this performance as they are competing with each other so we are going to generate see you know a way that that we can have more and more you know elite racers uh, offline so now say offline i generate and i'll tell you how we do that 
offline, we generate 20 really good racers that are, you know, very competitive. They have very short lap times. They're able to find the race line along the track. And then online, what we're going to do is, as we start driving, we're going to start observing how this other agent, is, how, how the opponent is. And you're going to say, hmm, this opponent looks quite similar to a mix of, you know, my, uh, my prototype driver uh, number six and a little bit of prototype number 17 and 19. And if I weigh them correctly, I get a really good estimate. So I'm going to just say that, oh, well, this, this driver that I see over here is a mix of this driver. And then maybe that driver will start changing its behavior. But so offline, we're just going to generate elite drivers who are, and I'll show you how we do that. So, so when we are driving autonomously, we have, you know, sensors and perception here, you know, this is like, you know, uh, RGB camera data, depth sensor, uh, optical flow sensors, how fast things are moving. We are capturing them as a semantic map. And we feed all of this LiDAR camera data and process them into the planner. And the planner has like multiple layers. So the planner is saying, okay, here's my mission. My mission says to drive from, you know, uh, from uh, downtown LA to Irvine. And this is the, the road I'm gonna take. I'm gonna get onto, you know, four or five South and take this road. And the behavioral planner says, okay. So the mission planner is kind of like Google maps. And it's saying, okay, this is your end to end goal. You have some traffic, so you're going to pick like a minimum, you know, cost or fastest path to get to your home. Uh, the behavioral planner over here says, okay, you want to get onto 405 South. Now you need to take, you know, this uh, on ramp over here. You need to get into the right, uh, the rightmost lane, and and then get onto the on ramp. The local planner then says, oh, you want to get onto the on ramp. Here are possible trajectories. Now let's. Uh, pick the best trajectory. And what is the best trajectory? It's the one, you know, in racing, for example, you want to pick a trajectory that has the lowest curvature so you can go at the highest speed. So in fact, in, when we have an opponent over here, we are generating a set of trajectories for our car. So this red car is our car. We call it the ego vehicle. And the ego vehicle is generating these trajectories and it's saying, okay, these are possible ways I could actually go around this corner. And then it is figuring out what is the lowest cost or the most efficient trajectory to take out of these possible trajectories. So this is called like a sampling based planner. It's sampling ahead of itself and saying, these are feasible trajectories. They uh, do not violate the constraints of my vehicle dynamics, my Ackerman steering. I'm not gonna go out of, you know, uh, but then it picks the trajectory that says, okay, I'm not going to go too close to the other agent, but I'm going to go as fast as I can around this corner. And, uh, uh, but the question here is we don't want to just generate like a steering angle. We want to generate a whole, what we call is a driving policy or the behavior of a driver in response to the other driver. So offline now, what we're going to do is we're going to generate now many, many different drivers and we're going to simulate them to drive along say this particular track. And, and so I'm not gonna go into the details of what we're doing offline too much, but you can think of it as a search engine. We are having multiple competitions. They're competing with other agents. And then the agents that become more elite, they start to go into what are called these colder baths for an optimization problem. And, and eventually after we do the search and we run you know, many, many competitions, and the agents improve their techniques with each comp uh, competition. Then we come up with a set of say, like you know, like I said before, twenty elite uh, drivers like that, right? So that means they have the minimum lap time, uh, but they also have diversity. That means they don't just follow the same race line along the whole path, and also they don't when they are overtaking or coming up with an overtake strategy. Then they always don't take the inside or the outside. They they have a diversity in that. So they're elite and they are diverse. And so now say, okay, I have 20, you know, uh, agents that have generated through what we call an approach called, you know, self-play. And so self-play is just saying that I don't have any prior knowledge of who I'm going to compete with, but I'm going to generate pretty competitive agents uh, that are just as good as, you know, a real agent, but they're not necessarily exactly like how this F1 driver would drive or that F1 driver is going to drive today. Uh, so because we don't know what their, their strategy is, it's secret. 
So, but we are saying, okay, but we have like these elite drivers uh, and online, then what we're going to do is like I showed before, we'll take, we'll, we'll generate our samples of how we're going to uh, pick uh, like of possible trajectories that we can take, but then we're going to capture like a prediction of an opponent. And I'm going to tell you about how we'll capture this prediction of the opponent through subsequent observations. But let's say once we know with some confidence what the opponent is going to do, then we say, okay, this opponent is most likely going to take this kind of trajectory. What should I do? So I basically, as an ego agent, say, this is my best strategy to try to outcompete the opponent or at least be competitive enough to be able to gain some, some uh, distance you know, relative to the opponent and uh, be able to uh, then eventually be able to overtake them. So once I have an expectation of how the other driver is going to drive, I can actually now drive pretty aggressively in that. But the question is, how do I know what the opponent is going to do? And that's why we come to this online portion. So now the race has started, and now we're going to drive. Uh, and um, I don't know what my opponent is going to do in the beginning of the race. So I have a lot. My uncertainty of what the opponent was going to do is a big uncertainty ball. And now... As I make observations and successive observations, what I'm going to do is called uh, essentially a multi-arm bandit you know, game where I'm trying to now figure out, say I have these three opponent models, opponent model one, two, and three, and say these are just you know, strategies of how a driver is going to drive along say this turn over here. And so let's say I pick opponent model one, and I estimate that this opponent is going to take this trajectory as they go forward. And this is where, given that I'm driving right here. So I'm just making like an estimate. Oh, looks like they, if, they, if, if they were like opponent one, they would make this, uh, this, they would take this trajectory. If they were like opponent two, they would take this trajectory. And if they were opponent like opponent three, they would take this trajectory over here. But in reality, they take some trajectory that is not exactly any of these. And so we say, oh, well, it's a mixture of these possible trajectories of, of these possible models over here. So it's a weighted you know, scheme. Uh, and we want to basically figure out now you know, what exactly is the mix of my prototype driving agents that this opponent is most like. Maybe it's like 33% like this, 5% like that, 12% like this other opponent. And out of these three uh, opponent models, for example, it's some weighted mix at this particular time. But I also have some uncertainty and that's the error in terms of, well, it is like this mix, but it's not always fitting exactly that uh, over there. So that's what we term, you know, now I, I don't want to get into the jargon. I want to just provide you the, in, the, the, the intuition of what we are trying to do, but Technically, this means it's a distributionally robust trajectory cost. It's just saying that we're looking at a distribution of the opponent behavior, not like trying to pinpoint, oh, you are like, you know, driver X plus Y and 33% like driver Z. Uh, no, that we are looking at a distribution of how this driver is going to behave. And now look at the other distributions of our prototype drivers and then match that. So in fact, as we start this race, now the opponent is, is driving and we say, oh, this opponent is like a good mix of these three agents with this weighting. And then as they drive, they also start to evolve and change their strategy. And then we, but we are keeping tab on them and we are we're really noting, okay, what sort of, how have they changed this weighting, say just in this simple case of three opponents uh, models. Um, in, the, in reality, we have more opponent models, uh, but this is just to show this as an example that this weighting can change over time and we are continuously updating our estimate, but we still have a very good estimate of how they're going to now maneuver. So here's another way of explaining that, right? So say, for example, initially I have like these six opponent prototypes and this is just abstractly showing like here's strategy one, two, three, four, five, six of uh, how, how, what we have generated as our agents offline. And then as we observe, we see that this weighting starts to change. And then over time, it starts to sort of get to maybe dominating the opponent mixture is more like, they're more like opponent five, and then they have some other weighted mix of the other opponents. And that gives us you know, a very uh, low uncertainty or low ambiguity 
on how they're going to behave. So then when we generate our trajectory, we say, aha, uh -huh, I can outcompete you because I know how you are starting to think. And that's exactly what we're trying to do. We are trying to get into the mind of the other agent and, and be able to then say, okay, now we can outcompete you. But this is very different from you know, the kind of game theory that is usually spoken about because this is a continuous game. This is a dynamic game. It's full with full dynamics. So it becomes very intractable to solve it using conventional you know, Nash equilibriums and game theoretical approaches. So we have to come up with these kind of learning based approaches. So let's go to like, okay, what are we trying to do now over here, right? Suppose in the beginning, I want to say, look, I want to remain safe. And by remaining safe, that means that I want to make sure that I have like a time to collision, how how long, how quickly am I going to hit into the other hit the other vehicle? I want to make sure that if the time to collision is less than 0.5 seconds, I'm very close to them. So uh, I want to spend less time in that. So the less, so the more robustness I, I want, that means the higher safety, the more conservative I want to become, I spend less time in this you know, near accident case of being you know, in a time to collision of less than 0.5 seconds. So we know that now by, you know, making the agent have more robustness as part of our measure of safety, we actually experience, you know, lower time to collision, uh, uh, a lower proportion of uh, small time to collision events over here. So that's good. Our mini hypothesis of saying that, you know, we can become safer uh, by actually, you know, making ourselves space out further from the other agent and being a little bit more conservative allows us to become safer in terms of not getting into near accidents as often. But this, this comes as a cost like that, right? So in fact, if I'm driving very aggressively, then my win rate is about almost 60%. <clears throat> but if I start to have a larger robustness over here, that's saying how much spacing I want to have, now with the other vehicle, my win rate drops from about 59 or 60% to 49 or 50%. So almost 10%, 10% is like basically a career choice over here. And uh, so what we see is that, you know, being more conservative, obviously it results in a decrease in performance and uh, we win less frequently because, you know, we are much more conservative. So the main goal of what this work is trying to do is really to, Ask, answer this question that, okay, initially I don't know much about my opponent. And so I have a large, you know, robustness ball or I'm trying to be more conservative. But as I learn about the opponent, so basically I have this online adaptivity to the opponent's strategy and, I, and identifying the uh, opponent's strategy, then can I regain my aggressive, you know, performance from an aggressive strategy without compromising safety? That means it's just saying that I know very well what you're gonna do next with a high confidence in terms of a probability distribution. And now I can perform uh, uh, very aggressive maneuvers uh, and, and regain essentially my win rate over here. So uh, when I have a non-adaptive win rate, when I'm very unsafe, I can have a high win rate, but I may not actually complete the race because I might crash over there. Uh, but when this, adaptive win rate where I'm doing this online adaptivity over here, I actually can maintain a high win rate while being very safe. That means this is my high robustness at the same time. So this is just saying that, look, we are able to dynamically now switch between, you know, being very safe, but also being very aggressive in the game because now we have a good estimate of how the opponents are gonna behave that right so for all the theory that we do we even like sort of do this at scaled uh, race cars so here we have this this ego vehicle is this blue car over here and it's doing these overtakes with the other agent so here we have these two agents the, the lead agent is who we need to overtake and and we are observing them so say in about 400 observations running at about you know uh, uh, 10 hertz uh, I, I mean uh, about 40 hertz with the lidar we are able to then very quickly in a couple of seconds be able to capture how the opponent is able to uh, you know adapt and we can come up with strategies to behave uh, in in response to the opponent 
And so what we are able to do in this first piece of work was, you know, to synthesize first, you know, a diverse population of high performance policies without seeing the opponent. And then, and that's offline. And then online, we're able to then use this, you know, uh, efficient and distributionally robust uh, online planning to figure out an adaptation strategy <clears throat> by learning the opponent's behavior. And then this helps us combine, you know, uh, safe overtaking maneuvers, but while translating to faster lap times and better win rates. Um, so, so that's, you know, it, it's a little bit involved and I skipped over a lot of the math that is under the hood, but I hope you at least get, you know, some intuition. If you have any questions, you know, feel, please feel free to ask them. Uh, I, I want to make sure that, you know, the work is, you know, approachable and, and it's accessible rather than just, you know, saying, oh, we do some cool work, but maybe it's not as understandable. Uh, well, well, thank you. Anybody who has questions, you can either um, type them in, in the chat or you should be able to unmute. Uh, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and uh, ask the first one, which is, so verifying this model, you're using, uh, you know, some scale model cars. Is there any plan any time in the future to actually do this? I realize it'd be very expensive and, and somewhat risky on, on actual real full-size cars. Yeah, so we don't, yeah, that's a great question. Like, you know, how do you validate your work, right? I mean, if you're a physicist, if you're trying to do like some, you know, medical research, you have to validate it eventually on patients, but you start with simulation, then you go through data and then you go through animals and then you go through. So, so I think this, this work, it's, it's, it's validated, you know, a lot in a very high fidelity physics based, you know, simulation models mm -hmm. and, uh, and and they and today the gap between sim to real, in fact, whatever we code up here directly runs on these cars, and then they can run on the next level cars. And I'll show you through the rest of the talk how whatever we generate on these little toy level self-driving RC cars, um, they they have a full stack for perception planning and control. The same software runs on full size cars. Of course, I don't have three hundred and fifty thousand dollars per car, and if yeah. they crash. Uh, but but I'll, I'll show you that, you know, there is a lot of work actually going with full size autonomous racing cars and they are gradually building up to this stage. They are more like, you know, years the, the last two years was like, can we just get them to lap at, you know, uh, to drive at, you know, uh, 300 plus kilometers per hour. I'll use kilometers per hour because that's the official <laughs> units for IEEE. Uh, and, and, and so essentially the... Uh, and now they have figured out, okay, now how do we just do a simple overtake? Because you're driving at such high, uh, and I'll show you possibly some videos of that. Uh, and they will get to this. So we are really looking at like uh, the next level problem of strategies. But uh, think about it this way, right? We are using racing as both uh, metaphorically as a, and literally as a vehicle to sort of come up with agile, agile, autonomous agents. We're not just focused on driving and autonomous driving. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I think our goal is not to make a robo taxi. You know, our goal is to say, okay, how do we come up with these algorithms later on, whether they are algorithms in a market, uh, algorithms that are in trading or uh, bidding or auctioning uh, that can dynamically adapt to other algorithms, other agents' algorithms by uh, understanding the nature of their behavior like that, right? So, so it's a little bit more, um, right? we're trying to get more in that foundational direction than just putting it in racing cars. Of course, racing cars, you know, every student in my lab is very passionate about them, but uh, there, there has to be like, you know, something more practical that puts food on the table than just saying, oh, we play with a lot of toy cars like that, right? So, uh, but, but that's a great question. How do you validate all this work? And I think we take it in stages and I'll build up all the way to running autonomous driving software to real cars. Hopefully if, if we get to the end of uh, this talk. Like that. So, so let me uh, get to the next stage of like saying, okay, well, uh, that's fine. But how, how can we come up with ways in which, you know, when we are racing, for example, we have a long game. That means we start out say at this position 
uh, at the at the uh, at the gunshot, and then we start to drive, and then at some point I can say I observed, observed, observed my green opponent. The orange is 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 the ego, and at this point I say, okay, I know how they're going to drive, and then I start to change my strategy. The thing is that you know how you drive and how you change your strategy. They are very very uh, intractable problems because they are continuous. The state space is very very large. Um, for motion planning and for the behavior of the other agents. So we need to figure out a way to you know, shrink the problem or do a dimensionality reduction to say, look, there, this, this, there are so many possible variations of overtaking, of changing you know, my, my curvature, my velocity, my acceleration, how much you know, wheel slip I want to ex budget I have and, and to go on with that. And then when I change my strategy, I want to say, okay, how do I become say, more aggressiveness, but in this style of aggressiveness. And so I can that therefore outcompete them. So what we call this kind of game, you know, is called an extensive game. That means I have a sequential decision model and I have opportunities to keep changing my strategy. And I'm not just trying to win by the next turn. I'm really trying to say, okay, I'm going to observe and I'm going to change my strategy dynamically till I can come up with a way to outcompete my opponent. And so this is the continuous world. What we really want is a simpler world uh, where we just have say restraint and aggressiveness on two axes. And we have different policies that we can drive in. And once we observe that the opponent is, you know, in this operating point, we can decide to be, become more aggressive and then outcompete them. But becoming more aggressive always is not gonna help you if the opponent is very aggressive to begin with. And we also become more aggressive, we'll both crash game over and we didn't win like that, right? We can't mark that as a win. So we have to kind of do this balance like that, right? So the other thing is we have imperfect information like in the previous case, we don't know what the opponent's behavior is like, we have to learn it. So we have perfect recall. That means every move they make, we record and we are processing that. When we come to this decision point, we change our strategy and we say, oh, well, we'll let's become more aggressive this way. Let's change our strategy. But offline, we have generated now lots of good strategies. And these are along a Pareto front of strategies. So the, the question is, you know, if I'm going to have a multi-round you know, game, how can I keep adapting and changing my strategy to then outcompete? And so as I mentioned, the vehicle planning space is intractable because you know, uh, there are so many different, like the state space of how to do like a maneuver in this continuous space is, is so large uh, that it's infinitely large. And so we cannot just you know, solve this problem in the continuous motion planning stage. And also like, you know, if I change my approach, the opponent's gonna change their approach. So the game also becomes intractable because it's an interactive game. So essentially what we had to do was to say, okay, if this is opponent, I'm gonna sort of, I could have different ways I could overtake from the left, overtake from the right, I could slow down, uh, which is the best strategy at this moment. And, but there are many different costs, you know, because I want to maintain a continuous uh, a driving with, without high curvature and, and, and high speed at the same time. I want to, uh, uh, so, so what is the best way at, at any point to, so I'm going to now just have different costs of how to decide how, how I'm going to drive in, in offline now, and I'm going to run this, you know, uh, at least a million times in different scenarios of the race. And what then I'm going to be able to generate after that is to say, okay, I have now a set of elite policies. And these policies now are, not, are discrete policies. That means each policy is parameterizing that, okay, this agent is going to overtake from the right in this manner. And uh, with this uh, velocity, with this acceleration, with this curvature, and, and they, these policies in the simulations have won more races than other policies. So we've come up with a set of good policies, just like in the previous case, but now we are just putting them in this two dimensional space of conservativeness and aggressiveness. And now we're going to say, okay, we have these policies and uh, we have captured them you know, iteratively by improving these policies through this you know, self-play. And then we come up with a game strategy to say, okay, if I have a policy, I'm not going to remain in that policy because once I have observed my opponent, I need to switch policies. 
how do I come up with a switch from one policy to another? So switching from one policy to another is called a strategy. And, and if you play some board games and you will say, oh, this is the strategy. If you play like say Jin Rami or you're playing poker, you have your own strategy to, to sort of say, okay, based on what I think the opponent is doing, this is how I'm going to counter them. And then you're going to change strategies as the game progresses. So we capture this formally, you know, in a, in a approach called counterfactual regret minimization. I won't go into the details of that, but it's just saying that with each iteration, what is the best action I can take? And, uh, and we basically use a neural network to learn that strategy. So we're just saying we run many of these games and we learn that strategy. So then when we actually run the race next time and we say, okay, this is the best way to switch from this. Now you need to switch from this policy to that policy. So all that strategy is telling you is what is the next policy you need to get to, you need to switch to, given that <clears throat> what we know about the, uh, the opponent like that, right? So, so there are two parts. The first part is just capturing this continuous game uh, by generating a lot of you know uh, plays uh, uh, at at every turn at every straight for for different tracks and uh, and then saying okay these are elite moves that you can have at that right so these are like if you're watching football this is like a short play this is a and but then as you're going through like first quarter second quarter they're changing their plays they're going to change their strategy to say okay well we need to we need to now you know. Uh, switch our formations and, and go in that form, that, that way forward. And so how you switch now from these, these policies to a strategy is given by this uh, game theoretic approach over here. And so just, just to illustrate it here, you know, as we start the game, uh, you know, we, we are observing the, the opponent over here and then we are coming up and we are, we are, we are saying, okay, now we have a decision point. And I'm going to switch my strategy from this one to this one. This is a very simple example. It's just saying, oh, I can get more aggressive and then I can show you the simple case, but I can do an overtake. What we do show though, with a lot of extensive statistical studies where we have captured the p-values with, so with high confidence over here, we, we have seen that we can, we can un, out-compete you know, opponents on unseen maps and unseen opponents, that means, yeah, we have trained on some certain set of opponents, but now the question is, okay, I'm gonna bring you a new opponent and he's gonna be smarter than you. Uh, can you deal with that? So we still have a very high win rate compared to a non-game theoretic approach. And then it also works on unseen maps over here uh, where we can say, okay, I've never driven on this racetrack. I've never driven with this opponent and I can still start to outcompete them by having this very adaptive strategy that uses this game theoretic approach. And so this just shows many examples of, okay, if initially the opponent is more aggressive than me, then gradually with each, you know, say eight second iteration, I become gradually more and more and more aggressive till I can outcompete them. In some cases, you know, the opponent is more aggressive than, than me, and I become less aggressive initially, only to become more aggressive a little bit later on when the conditions allow for that. So this is sort of a way in which, you know, it's not, it's balancing how aggressive it gets. It's not always saying I'm going to become more and more aggressive. It's deciding when to uh, become more aggressive or become as aggressive as the opponent in this case. So, uh, so here you can see as we start the game, we've come to this decision point, we have changing our strategy. And, and then we can outcompete uh, the opponent. And so this, this sort of takes a very challenging problem of you know, continuous uh, action space and helps us discretize it by just you know, parametrizing what are good driving policies and then saying, which policy should I pick? Which policy should I pick next and switch as a strategy to outcompete? I know it's a little bit abstract, but uh, so the way in which you know we can use machine learning here is actually as a strategic approach, like that right? So it's how do we uh, like outcompete a pretty a very competent you know and a, and an adaptive competent opponent over here. Uh, so so this is our research team uh, uh, where people like students and postdocs are working on different aspects of learning based control. Uh, learning-based localization, learning-based planning, uh, and perception, and uh, and really looking at different aspects of you know how can we learn from the world and still 
be very elite in that manner. We are not uh, building anything that is, you know, defense related or no killer machines. And we're also not interested in building machines that replace human beings, but we are really looking at, you know, this from a way in which how can these agents now, they are anyway going to compete against other agents like that, right? So it's not about replacing jobs of people. It's really about when you have agents actually doing a lot of trading, most of the trading today, for example, is all algorithmic trading. They have strategies in which they do that. But here we are looking at uh, competing in these, you know, uh, kind of uh, dynamic uh, games with real engineered systems. So it's a very fun lab. It's a very diverse lab and uh, lots of visitors from, you know, from TU Munich. We have uh, two new visitors from ETH Zurich and from uh, Nagoya University in Japan this week. And they stay with us for many months and they keep rotating through. So that makes it a very fun place. Uh, other problems, I'll just go through this quickly given the time that we have. I want, I want to also get to some very fun stuff that we do uh, is, uh, so I just quickly go through some research projects, but we'll get to the fun stuff in about two, three minutes. Uh, we look at like localization problems. So, you know, there is uh, these algorithms called SLAM, simultaneous localization and mapping. How does a robot know where it is in the world? And then how does it plan to go forward? So we normally those have like very iterative problem uh, of, of trying to figure out where they are in the world, but we map them into neural networks. And essentially we are compressing the entire map into the network and then looking up this, uh, the, the location within the neural network and it works very, very efficiently. It's like a order of magnitude, you know, faster, better, cheaper than uh, uh, traditional approaches over here. So, but by building this, we can run these localizations on much lower cost hardware on, on, so, and make the you know, onboard compute and the systems much cheaper, faster, better. Uh, we use that for localization with LIDARs and uh, we can use it for localization with cameras also. I won't go into the details, but it shows you that we can do this very efficiently. And here, this is a car driving through the corridors around our lab. The thing is that none of these images are real anymore. They are actually, they are trained on some different images. And then when it's pick, it's basically searching into the neural networks latent space and finding where it could be and generating these images back. So it's almost like it has driven through this corridor a few times and now it is, uh, it's, it's generating how it would be driving through this corridor uh, given its current pose as we drive through. None of these images were, you can see it's a little bit blurred uh, because they are not, not uh, they are not actually real images that we clicked. They are <clears throat> kind of interpolated from the images. But this just shows you that it's a very comp capable system to get accuracy of localizing and you know, sub centimeter accuracy at a city scale and extremely fast, right? So. As engineers, what we want is good, fast, and cheap. So we are able to show that we can do this in a good, fast, and cheap manner, uh, and uh, and and we can, you know, interface this with Kalman filters and get, you know, sub like 0 0.1 meter accuracy. And this is actual driving, you know, around in the corridors to show how how uh, precise the locations are. Other things we look at is, you know, how do you drive on multi-friction surfaces? and adapt your controller as the dynamics of the vehicle change. And so this is another approach where we use many different Gaussian models and dynamically pick, like change the weighting for the control algorithm to adapt. Uh, kind of like, you know, if you're going from a road with a high traction and then you go over an oil slick, then you can adapt to that oil slick in real time and, and get to a safer position. Uh, and this is just showing that I'm skipping over the details, but it's just showing that as it goes from different friction surfaces, it still maintains very good low tracking error, unlike other approaches. And it's doing all of this online real time as it goes through that. Uh, so let's talk about for like, you know, uh, five, 10 minutes, so uh, less than 10 minutes, some really fun stuff that we do in outreach and in, in really uh, training and building a community around, you know, learning about the future you know, of autonomous systems. And so we built this uh, uh, F110 as a community. It's a very open source. It's a very open community. There are many people now, uh, over 
you know, 2000 active people, that means engaging on a daily basis and over 80 universities. And we basically have competitions, courses, and the whole idea is that, you know, when students come to university or even when any one of us are educated, we have few topics that we learn and we learn them in isolation. Say, you know, this is my uh, interests are in formal methods. How do we build, you know, mathematical models of systems to guarantee their safety? Uh, control systems, machine learning. But then, you know, when you say you learn about, you know, signal processing, you learn that in isolation from say the platforms that you're using. You learn that in isolation from how other parts of the system are working. When students go to, from the, to get to their first job, maybe they join say Ford Motor Company. They work in a particular division, subdivisions, groups, specialization, and they're just testing like a certain part. And so they don't get to work on the whole system, but our belief is that you know training and education should be at a systems level. And so we want to build these systems that are complex enough, but not too complex. So like this RC car that is now retrofitted to become a self-driving car. Yeah, it's actually pretty, you know, it's not so complex, but it has a GPU and, you know, on board and it does a lot of processing. It has LIDARs, cameras, power distribution systems. And now it can do very interesting things. So what we say is that it's one tenth the size of a full sky car. But it's 10x the fun because you can drive it, you can crash it, you can basically make it, you know, operate at the limits of its performance. And we provide uh, simulators, 2D simulators for planning and control, 3D simulators for including perception. And whatever you design and your algorithms you do in the simulator, they work on the real vehicle. Because our goal is to help the community build, code, and race. And but we go from simple, like you know, obstacle object uh, avoidance, obstacle avoidance algorithms to SLAM. So simultaneous localization and mapping runs on board, runs very efficiently, and the code is very clean. We go from simple, like you know, uh, finding a path reactively as you're driving, like you know, key examples that students have in their uh, high school and their undergrads, to much more, you know. Uh, motion planning algorithms like rapidly exploring random trees that's used in full scale, you know, autonomous driving vehicles. And that are like near optimal algorithms, uh, probabilistic algorithms um, that actually can make the car drive very efficiently. We go from simple PID control that most students would learn in their junior years uh, to model predictive control and building a model of the vehicle and then coming up with optimal control uh, for uh, driving. Uh, and uh, so this this basically is taking all the training and the level of learning up a couple of notches, but all of this is integrated in the platform. And so when we also have a course where we start students from the ground level, we don't assume too much about what they know. They just have basic knowledge of linear algebra and then and basic coding in Python or C++, and then we take them forward from there. There are no exams, but just race one is after... Uh, uh, six weeks, race two is at 10 weeks, and then race three is at 16 weeks. And with each race, they are really putting all of the algorithms that they learn into action. And this gives the students a chance to go from the, the math to the code, to simulation, to the actual system, and then to see you know, exactly what their concepts are, you know, working on a physical system, interacting at, and trying to push the limits over here. And uh, they cover a lot of topics. I won't go into the details, but but uh, essentially over the years we've had, and then the students do different projects in the last month of their class. And these are topics of their choice. And they are pretty like hardcore topics on perception, planning and control, all the basic elements of robotics and autonomous systems. And with a lot of learning based, machine learning based elements. And now they are like leaders of motion planning. This is from 2017. It obviously goes on till 2024 uh, in, in Tesla, Nvidia Autonomous, Honda Autonomous, Amazon Robotics, uh, and different companies. And the whole idea is to you know, be very inclusive as a community to train the next students as part of it like that, right? Everything is available on the F110 website over here. And, uh, that are like IKEA, IKEA like simple instructions on how to build the cars, how to code them, but lots of lectures, video lectures, and, and the code is very clean and documented. 
and with simulators and uh, thousands of students have used this. So now uh, we have learned over time and, and it, we made it much more streamlined. And then there are competitions. There are many competitions over the years in different countries and top conferences for you know, robotics, for cyber physical systems, for control systems. In fact, this year we have seven competitions in different uh, top conferences. And they're very, very fun because students come from across the world with the reference platform. That's where we have the formula F1 tenth. Um, and they build them, they come and bring them along and then they race along. And you can see they're very happy. It's a very competitive races, but very fun. So this is just showing an example of ETH Zurich and another team, like and how they are actually competing. And uh, and then these essentially all the students, they when they get onto the track, they basically scan the track with the lidar over here, and they build a map of the track. Then they come up with an optimal race line, and then they figure out you know planning and motion control strategy, like say with model predictive control or different strategies uh, to track that race line to come up with overtaking strategies. And so it's quite non-trivial and, you know, it's a mix of like all the way from PhDs to undergrad to even some high school students and, uh, and, and even people from, from companies come in. Uh, but the idea is that no one can have an unfair advantage. They all have to have the same vehicle. You can't have faster motors. It's a battle of algorithms, not a battle of money over here. And uh, here's another example. You can see how agile they are. So these and so these are in different and then students make uh, really good dashboards on how to come up with strategies for racing. Yeah, and then, you know, then lots of uh, students, like this is a freshman from University of Waterloo. He, he made this video a couple of months ago and it's, you know, they, they know how to make good viral videos. I don't, but this has over 600K views. Others have like 400, 500K views. In, as I mentioned, in, in 2024, we will have seven competitions. We have many workshops on racing and we bring in like actual, like, you know, autonomous race car engineers, people from Sony, uh, people who are doing off-road racing uh, and it's a very exciting community also very theoretical community on like you know these dynamic games so a lot of the mathematics behind the scene of how to do this and there's a really nice community across you know across the globe now uh, the last topic I'll just spend two minutes on is you know on it's now okay fine we are doing this as an academic exercise we are we have outreach to students but how do we impact industry that, right, so we have AutoWare, which is, as I mentioned before, the world's leading open source autonomous driving uh, software stack, and that's part of that. That runs on buses, on robo taxis in Japan, buses in Michigan, uh, shuttle buses in uh, different in, in Korea and and in in uh, in Taiwan and logistics systems. So the same software is running on all of these vehicles, and it's open source. And then they, they sort of specialize it for their use case, but this is what gets them started. There are over you know, 70 companies that are part of this, you know, from small companies to big companies like Arm, uh, ADAS, AD Link, which is uh, part of uh, uh, Foxconn, to uh, you know, TomTom and Xilinx and Intel. Uh, and uh, so, so they are all part of this. They're contributing, you know, people code uh, to build this uh, uh, together. We also have centers of excellence. So these are all faculty across the world from, you know, Turkey to Poland, to UCLA over here to Munich, Czech Technical University, Japan, Taiwan. They all have vehicles which, you know, use autoware. And they all specialize in different areas, you know, uh, 
And we work together as a community to say, okay, how do we help each other? How do we grow this? How do we you know, collaborate? We have a lab. This is a different lab from my main research lab. This is the AutoWare lab in Philadelphia. It's a garage lab and we have different electric vehicles uh, that we are developing the autonomous driving capability for these skateboard-like chassis over here. So we have AutoWare running on the 110 scale. We have AutoWare running on go-karts that are half scale. And then AutoWare running on full scale vehicles. Uh, and we are interested in all these kind of on-street and off-street use cases. And this is just an example of master students. So like 21, 22 year olds. Now they, they come together, they built this kind of uh, self-driving go-kart, drive by wire, steer by wire, brake by wire system, all in well, four and a half months. The mechanics, the electronics, everything is designed by them from scratch. It's all documented, it's all open sourced. They, they sort of work together as a team and they build this uh, in a very short amount of time. And they won the autonomous go-karting competition last year uh, in Purdue University. You can see how happy they are after not sleeping for two days. But uh, I think that that just is a very fun team. Uh, so I'll stop here. You know, I think our, our way forward is to say, okay, how can we design? You know, our goal is to design safe systems and to provide guarantees for safety, especially when you have machine learning and AI. And we explored that today. I just told you about how we do this in racing. Maybe in a separate talk, we'll talk about what we do with implantable medical devices like you know, pacemakers and defibrillators. And that's a whole different area that we work on with cardiologists where software is running inside the medical devices. And we want to make sure that the software is shocking or not shocking the patient appropriately. Um, and the, but the software is autonomous. It's running inside of your body. And so that's what we focus on you know, is, as uh, our research is when you have learning-based software that is in life critical systems, how do you ensure and guarantee the safety of them while they are actually performing at the best possible way? All right, I will stop here and I can take uh, any questions uh, that people have. And... Well, thank you. Uh, we, we did have a couple, uh, a couple questions that uh, came in in the chat. Um, I will attempt to read the first one properly. Um, is there a way for a player slash car to head fake or feint a move? Something like Martin Nowak's stochastic for tat prisoner dilemma agent that has a small chance of defecting. Yeah, yeah. Actually, that's like a, a specific problem that we are looking at is that, you know, so they are they are continuously faking moves and we don't know what's real or fake and we are learning their overall behavior. But, you know, uh, uh, so so yes, we, we are, you know, the, the fake move is part of their distribution of their behavior. Maybe it's not happening as often and therefore it becomes a smaller part. That's why we look at behaviors as distributions. But I'll tell you one interesting sub problem we are looking at is how can I, suppose I'm competing with, with Don and he's a really good racer, then how can I learn about say his, his behavior to about 80% accuracy, but while interacting with him and faking it and nudging him. Uh, but at the same time, he's only be able to learn about 60% accuracy of me. So can I do this stealthy way of system identification in this dynamic environment? So yes. So I think that that we we definitely think of fakes and we think of you know uh, uh, different types of ways in which the opponent perturbs their strategies. All right. Uh, next question. Um, I, you touched on this, I think, but uh, how many iterations slash laps does it take for to get close to predicting what the opponent car tracks? Yeah. So in in simulation, it takes about uh, 150 to 400 iterations of observations. Uh, and you can imagine the LIDAR is running at about 40 hertz. So that happens quite quickly. And then we are updating our estimate. As I showed you, the estimate keeps moving around. In reality, because of the field of view of the LIDAR uh, and the other the opponent goes out of the field of view, comes in the field of view, uh, it takes about between about uh, uh, I think it's about 350 to 600 iterations. But 600 iterations happen in maybe about uh, uh, seven, eight seconds like that of observation. Wow. So we are, we are zoning in very quickly and we are latching on. And then we are saying, okay, this is how they are. We are they're not following like a consistent strategy according to what we expect, but we are latching on them. And, and it goes into high 
of uncertainty, low uncertainty, but then we have we have basically we are tracking their behavior now. All right. Uh, I don't see anything else in the chat, so if anybody wants to type, uh, type quickly, and uh, otherwise, uh, Don, if you have any uh, closing remarks. No, I just want to thank Rel for the fantastic presentation. It's uh, uh, quite amazing how, uh, how this has uh, progressed over the years. So thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Don, and, and Teron.